God is one and yet church councils finally arrived at the position that somehow God is three that somehow in the doctrine of the Trinity three can become one of course they use many many arguments to try to prove and I'm sure many of you have heard it from, from the Christians for example the water just reminded me of one of the examples um, one of the arguments for the Trinity that is often given is that three can become one because water can take three forms it can be ice, it can be a liquid or it can be a vapor or they say look at the egg there's a shell, there's a white and there's a yellow I don't know which one's the Father, which one's the Son and which one's the Holy Spirit or what happens when you scramble your egg or in America they'll say there's three in one oil <laughs> with the point being that Jesus said hear O Israel the Lord your God is one he didn't say hear O Israel or hear O United States the Lord your God will be three in one the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit he said hear O Israel the Lord your God is one the second point was that he said that we should love God with our whole heart soul mind and strength I wish these Christian missionaries would remember that third point the mind and strength they have it right with the heart and the soul and sometimes with the strength they work overtime distributing their three easy steps to get into heaven but they forget the mind sometimes and it's very frustrating very frustrating indeed in fact Martin Luther the father of the Protestant Reformation said don't look at your reason in fact pardon my language but I'm only quoting Martin Luther he said reason is a whore if you want to be saved, you have to tear the eyes out of your reason. That's a very dangerous position as far as I'm concerned. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, second century in fact, said, after Jesus Christ we have no need of speculation. After the gospel, no need of research. When we come to believe, we have no desire to believe anything else. So he said something that I think is extremely dangerous. He said, if anyone could prove to me that Jesus is outside the truth, and if the truth really did exclude Jesus, I would prefer to stay with Jesus and not with the truth. Very dangerous position because we're saying, okay, religion becomes a matter only of feeling. The emphasis being upon having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ even if that means that I have to shelve my brain. And the consequence of that is that in the West we live almost a schizophrenic life. Very rational individuals with their degrees in engineering, etc. And at the same time when they go to church they put their faith in mysteries and don't think. In fact, we used to joke, and I'm not making fun of the church, um, we used to joke that the reason that the Catholics had holy water by the door was so that we could wash the world off when we went into the church and we could wash the church off when we went back out into the world. It's a double kind of life that we live and it's understandable because we have to live our lives as rational human beings. And at the same time they feel the need, the natural need to submit their lives to God. And the third point that Jesus brought up in the Gospel of Mark about loving thy neighbor as thyself. But if you've ever read through the Bible, you'll find out that it doesn't tell you how. How do I do that? How do I love my neighbor as myself? For example, just a few questions that Christian theologians, even today, are grappling with is, does the Bible permit or does it outlaw capital punishment? Or is it silent on the issue? In Islam, we know very clearly. But in Christianity, they debate, and they debate because it's not set forth within the Bible. For example, what form of economic system is described by the Bible? In uh, the United States, they say capitalism is what was described as the uh, paradigm uh, economic system within the Bible. They should read the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, it says that the apostles came together and they shared everything in common. It sounds almost like communism. And yet that's the enemy of, this, uh, the, enemy of the United States, capitalism. 
The point being that a clear economic system is not spelled out within the Bible. For example, what is the status of women within the Bible? And again, you will not get a clear position. Paul says, at one point, that in Christ there is no male or female, but everyone is equal. There is also neither Greek nor Jew, etc. And yet at the same time, he could say that when women were in the church, they should shut up, they should remain quiet. And the woman should submit to the husband, that she was lower than the husband. Strange position for someone who says that they're equal, and then he goes and says that, no, they're inferior. And if they should that shut up when they're, when they're in the church. Now, we, we don't pay any attention to that. In the Christian world today, we have women who are ministers, and I, I suppose they talk in the church. The point being, it's very difficult to live the life as it's set forth in the Bible. Or what form of politics does the Bible advocate? And again, you don't get a clear position. It simply says, at one point, again, it's Paul who's writing, Render unto Caesar that which is... No, in Jesus, I'm sorry. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. Fine. But which Caesar? And in which way do I render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Or what if Caesar wants that which is God? Etc., etc. All kinds of logical problems arise. There's an absence of social ethics within the Bible. Very, uh, an emphasis on personal ethics and how I should relate to an individual. But there's no social ethics. And many, many Christian writers themselves have wondered why is there no social ethics within the Bible? I think the answer is very clear. If you look at the writing of Paul within the Bible, he has said he was under the false impression that during his lifetime Jesus would come back to the earth and save them all. That the world was going to end in, the life, in their lifetime. Well, think about it. If you believe that the very next day the world is going to end, or very shortly the world is going to end, you don't sit down and work out an economic system. An economic system is irrelevant. You also don't believe that you have to marry. And that's why Paul comes right out and says, you don't have to worry about marrying. The only reason you should marry is if you can't control yourself, then go ahead and get married. But it's better to remain single. Then you can be like the angels. And the angels in heaven, it says it's in the Gospel of Matthew and also in Mark, that they do not marry. Poor angels. These problems con contrast tremendously with, with the Quran. For example, there's a passage in the Quran that I think sums up Islam in a very, very beautiful way. It's in Surah Al-Baqarah about Ayah 177. And it says, Virtue does not mean for you to turn your faces toward the east and the west. But virtue means that one should believe in God alone. The last day, the angels, the book, and the prophets. And no matter how he loves it to give his wealth away to near relatives and to orphans, and the needy, the wayfarer, and beggars, and towards freeing captives, and to keep up in prayer and pay the welfare tax, and those who keep their word whenever they promise anything, and are patient under suffering and hardship and in time of violence, those are the ones who act loyally, and they are the ones who perform their duty and love God. In that passage, we see many, many truths about Islam and truths that actually led me to Islam when I looked at the Quran. The basic truth, of course, the, the one of Tawheed or the oneness of God in, the, in exactly the same way that was preached by Jesus when he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God is one. Muhammad, peace be upon him, went one step further. It's not Hear, O Israel, but Hear, O Mankind, Hear, O Universe. It's not just to Israel now, but it's to the entire world and for all ages and all times that there is one and only one God. La ilaha illallah. The second point in there is that religion is not mere legalism. It's a relationship with God. It's the submission of one's heart and one's entire being to God. It's not enough that Muslims at the end of their prayer turn their faces to the east and the west and say salam. They need to get up and stand up and bring that salam and bring that peace to the world. They must work in the world. Another point is the continuity of the prophets and the messages. And again, that one opened my eyes when, I, when Islam helped me to see the Bible in a new light. For example, that, the verses 
that I read about, about Jesus saying that we should love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we should love our neighbor as ourselves. I always thought that Jesus was sort of making those words up on the spot. And then I began to think about it a little, a little more clearly. And I realized that in fact Jesus was quoting from the Torah. He was quoting from the revelation given to Moses. In fact, you'll find 